Here are the IQs of children separated by social economic status. As you can see, already at two years old, children of poorer families have on average a lower IQ than those of richer families, and it gets worse as they grow up. By the time the children reach the age of 16, the gap almost triples. On average, high SES adolescents have 16 IQ points more than low SES adolescents. Why is it happening? Is it because rich children simply have better genes, or is it because poor children are being brought up in worse environments? In this video, we are going to explore the reasons why this phenomenon is happening, and then I'll suggest solutions that are implementable for each reasons. But first, we need to take a small detour and dismantle a myth about IQ. IQ does not reflect genetic intelligence. What I mean by genetic intelligence is the intelligence that is determined by your genes. For example, if you were able to put a thousand people in the exact same environment from the womb and then gave them an intelligence test, the thing that would be tested could be considered genetic intelligence because a better score could only be explained by better genes and not a better environment. But modern IQ tests are not close of doing that, nor should they want to do that. The way IQ is determined is simply by making a population complete a bunch of tests, logic, verbal, working memory, and spatial recognition tests, and then making sure that the population average comes out to be 100. That's it. What the people constructing the IQ tests are hoping for is that the types of questions being asked are ones that are not too dependent on your environment and more dependent on your raw intelligence. For example, if I ask you the capital of Equatorial Guinea, well, if you answer correctly, that won't really tell me whether or not you're smart. If you give me the right answer, which is Malabo, the only thing that this would tell me is that you either travel there, know someone that lives there, or you like geography. So scientists had to come up with better questions. Here's an example of a question that you might find in a logic IQ test. These types of questions are better than the geography one because anyone who have eyes and a brain have the prerequisites needed to answer this question. I can make a tribe member from Australia or a Harvard University graduate answer this question and be confident that this would test their ability to deploy this type of logic. The problem is when we compare the score of the tribe member and the university graduate, our first assumption is that one must be naturally smarter than the other, which is not necessarily true. Now, I'm not saying that the test didn't assess accurately their ability to deploy abstract logic. I think it did. What I'm saying is that one does not necessarily need to be naturally smarter than the other to perform better. All they need is to be brought up in an environment that will better help them develop this ability. Simply put, being brought up in an environment where you need to use abstract logic more often will make you better at abstract logic. But how do I know that? How do we know that? How do we know that it's not just genes and your environment has a role to play in your intelligence? Well, there's two ways that we can be confident about it. The first hint that IQ is malleable is the Flynn effect. This effect delineates the increase of the average IQ by about three points with each generation. The Flynn effect presents itself in most, if not all, of the IQ tests. One of them, the Raven Progressive Mattresses, which, according to the author of the book Intelligence and How to Get It, is supposed to reflect raw intelligence, that which is not susceptible to contamination by culture or school, shows an average gain in intelligence of more than 28 points from 1947 to 2002. So if IQ really tested true or genetic intelligence, well, that would imply that we are either geniuses compared to our grandparents or our grandparents were intellectually disabled. But 60 years is not enough time for us to have had a complete genetic change. Therefore, what we can conclude is that what's being tested is something that can grow more effectively with better techniques, just like a muscle. The effect is so strong that better nutrition, less inbreeding, no more lead in pain, and less infectious diseases cannot account for all of the increase. The second hint that IQ does not test genetic intelligence is the fact that school increases IQ. Now, this fact has been contested a lot because if you say that people who have had more education also have higher IQs, it doesn't really answer the question of whether this is just correlation, while smarter people decide to get more educated, or causation, education increases IQ. Luckily, we can rely on a few natural experiments to offer insights. Natural experiments are ones that happen naturally without the intervention of scientists. The reason we need to rely on those is because, well, obviously, it would be unethical for scientists to take a few hundred children out of school, test them for the sake of science. So instead, they tested the IQ of children who didn't go to school for a period of time, not because of choice, 
but due to abnormal circumstances. One of them is the closing of Prince Edward County schools in Virginia. Let me give you a bit of context. On May 1st, 1959, two courts mandated Prince Edward County to allow white and black children to go to school together. But instead of following the path of other counties and integrating their schools, the Prince Edward County decided to completely shut down their public school system. In 1959, it finally happened. When the courts ordered immediate desegregation that September, Prince Edward did what no county in America had ever done. It closed its public schools. After closing the public school system, whites of the county started their own private school system. While most blacks only could afford makeshift schools in church basements, this caused many black children to not receive schooling for one to five years. When researchers compared the IQ of those children to others who had not been deprived of education, they found that a missed year of school resulted in a six-point lower IQ score. Natural experiments such as this one help us establish causation between increase in intelligence and schooling because there's no reason to believe that the black children observed in this study were inherently less intelligent than other black children that were not affected. Therefore, we can conclude that the lack of school was the cause of the decrease and not just a correlation. So, with the Flynn effect and the fact that school increases IQ, we can determine that IQ is not an accurate indicator of natural intelligence, but that doesn't mean that IQ is a useless measure. Higher IQ is correlated with better grades, career success, and as stated in a study called YG Matter, systematically improve individuals' odds of dealing successfully with the ordinary demands of modern life. So we can safely say that a society with a higher average IQ is more desirable than a society with a lower average IQ. Therefore, we should try to understand the reasons why rich children have higher IQs than poor children and then see what we can do about it. So that is what we're going to do. So let's go back to the gap. There are four main reasons why this is happening. The first one is, unsurprisingly, genetics. Although I do not believe that genetics is what is causing most of this gap, it would be naive of me to say that it has no effects. At the end of the day, we're only a combination of genes and environment. So if you happen to have genes that make it a bit easier to compete in your environment and then pass them on to your child, we could expect that your child will also do a bit better in their environment. But if genetics explain 20 to 50% of the gap, there's still a 50 to 80% that can be explained by something other than genetics, something that we can change. The second reason is because of the prenatal environment, the environment of the fetus in the womb. When you're in the womb, you're at the mercy of everything that your mother experiences, and it has been shown many times that if a mother experiences a lot of stress during her pregnancy, it will cause problems to the child's development. One study examining the effect of prenatal stress on child development tested children who were exposed to their mother's stress during the 1998 Quebec ice storm. For more context, in 1998, Quebec experienced a big ice storm that resulted in power losses for 3 million people for as long as 40 days. Here's a description from Canadian Geographic that described the intensity of the storm. Sidewalks became encased in a layer of ice up to 8 centimeters thick in places, trees snap under the weight, hydro lines sag, dragging wooden poles and steel pylons down with them. The study concluded that children exposed to high levels of stress during the storm had lower full-scale IQs verbal IQs and language abilities compared to children exposed to low or moderate levels of objective prenatal maternal stress. Now, with that in mind, we can assume that people of low SES, socioeconomic status, live under more stress than those of high SES, especially mothers. I will link some studies in the description down below, but it is easy to imagine that not knowing whether you'll be able to provide for your child, having to work while pregnant, and constantly worrying about money is something that pregnant women of high SES don't have to worry about, or at least worry about them less. This can lead to the children of low SES to have problems during their early childhood and those problems reverberating at school, thus contributing to the IQ gap. This leads me to the third reason. The third reason is that the home environment of working class families is less intellectually stimulating than the one of richer families. That means that the brains of low SES children before they reach school will not have the same opportunity to grow. Here's a few stats that can help us understand better the reason why the home environment of richer family is better to foster a child's development. The professional parent speaks about 2,000 words per hour to the child, whereas the working class parent speaks about 1,300. By the age of three, the child in the professional family has heard about 30 million words and the child in the working class family has heard about 20 million. The professional parents made six encouraging comments to their child for every reprimand. The working class parents 
gave only two encouraging comments per reprimand. In areas where almost all adults are college educated, booksellers had 1300 children's books available per 100 children, whereas in blue collar Irish and Eastern European neighborhoods, only 30 children's books were available per 100 children. That doesn't mean that working class parents are not working their hardest to provide a good environment for their children. I can think of a few reasons other than negligence that could explain the differences in parenting style. It could be that the nature of the jobs that working class parents are doing is less intellectually stimulating and creative and therefore when they come home to their children, it might be harder for them to raise their child to be curious when their own employers are not encouraging them to be curious. Or it might be because of financial stress or just stress in general. Now again, genes play a role in this equation, but we can be sure that it's not 100% of the story because when scientists decided to create a program to give working class children more intellectual stimulation, it actually increased their IQ and grades. One notable study called the Abyssidarian Program set out to give 111 at-risk children intensive preschool education. What at-risk means is simply that their mothers had an IQ of 85 or less, and so they were at risk of mental retardation. That's what it means. Teachers would conduct daily classes for groups of three to six children from the age of six months until kindergarten age. After having observed those children for more than 20 years, the results, similar to other programs, were really promising. At the age of three, the, the children in the program had an average IQ of 101, compared to 94 in the control group. By age 12, only 13% of the kids who received the intervention had an IQ of less than 85, compared to 44% in the control group. Furthermore, at the age of 21, those who had the intervention had 4.5 points of IQ more than the control. It also increased their high school graduation rate, their college attendance rate, and their likelihood of having a skilled job. Finally, the lower the IQ of the mother, the more the child benefited from the program. So, preschool programs like this one shows that if you give working class children more intellectual stimulation, you can actually reduce the gap in IQ. If we pair those results to the graph that I showed you at the beginning of the video, we can see that if at 3 years old, the average IQ for those who participated in the Abyssidarian program is 101, the gap would be non-existent. But I would expect the gap to increase when the children reach primary school because of the fourth reason. Summer breaks. Yes, the fourth contributor of the IQ gap are summer breaks. Research indicated that during the summer, the IQ of the middle class child either remains stable or increases. On the other hand, the IQ of the working class child decreases. This discrepancy potentially stems from the more intellectual nature of the activities that a middle class child engages in, such as museum visits, going to the zoo, or reading. If we treat the brain like a muscle, it makes total sense. A bodybuilder who just stops working out for three months every year will be less jacked than one who never stops. Now let's do a mini recap. The low SES and high SES child start their life at about the same place. They don't start exactly at the same place because there might be genetic differences. Then they grow in the womb and get exposed to a whole lot of things. The low SES child gets exposed to more stress and thus has a harder time developing than the highest yes child. After nine months, they are born in two completely different environments. The environment of the highest yes child is very stimulating. His parents are talking to him all the time, encouraging him to read books and to learn new things. For the lowest yes child, it's the same thing, but much less. Finally, they reach school and the low SES child is already behind by a lot, but the gap increases because every time they go on summer breaks, the low SES child doesn't engage in activities that are stimulating enough and therefore loses some IQ points. This explains the 16 IQ points gap when they both reach the age of 16. Now, what can we do about it? For genetics, there's nothing we can do unless you create CRISPR 5.0, but for the rest, there's a lot we can do. In the womb, because stress hormones have many negative effects on a fetus, our goal should be to implement policies that reduce them as much as possible. Maternal leave during and after pregnancy, or at least reduce hours during the pregnancy, psychological help and the ability, if possible, to choose the method of delivery could all help to reduce stress and the incidence of postpartum depression. The reason I added the ability to choose the method of delivery comes from an excerpt from the book Myth of Normal by Gabor Mate, which goes like this. 
The women who report the most positive birth experiences, she observes, are those who feel they understood all the decisions made and had a say in the decision-making process that holds even for complicated births among women who have been hoping for natural deliveries, births that require multiple interventions, births that end in surgery. So by that account, it seems like being in on the decision-making process can reduce stress. Now for early childhood, as mentioned earlier, preschool programs starting at the age of 6 months can greatly improve the odds of an at-risk child of succeeding at school. Also conducting more research to understand better what works and why it works when it comes to preschool programs could allow us subsequently to pass on this information to individual families that are not at risk. These programs, although expensive, can be a very good investment. James Heckman, a Nobel Prize winning economist, calculated that for every dollar invested in the Abyssidarian program, the government would save $3.78 in terms of special education classes avoided, extra years of schooling avoided, crime and welfare costs avoided, and a higher income for its participants. So even for people who are staunchly against welfare, these programs are a no-brainer because they, in the end, reduce the amount of people on welfare. Finally, for primary school and onwards, since we know the IQ of working class children decreases during the summer, finding ways to provide free activities of intellectual nature during this period could reduce the summer slump. Furthermore, instilling into those children the idea that intelligence can grow rather than being innate could increase their interest in learning, as explained in detail in the book Mindset by Carol Dweck. So in this video, I've shared the reasons why there is a gap in IQ between the rich and the poor and what we can do about it. The great thing about the solutions that just laid out is that most of them are not really controversial. To apply them, you don't need to take a stance for or against something like affirmative actions or whether college is worth it or whether we should extend welfare. Except maybe maternal leave, these solutions can be argued from a conservative standpoint and from a liberal standpoint. You can say that Preschool programs are a way to make future generations less reliant on the government and allow us to decrease our debt. Or you can say that reducing inequality between the rich and the poor should be our priority. Any way you spin it, I think that in the future, nations that prioritize children's development will be more successful than those who don't. Just like the previous video, this video started out as an essay published on my Substack called Equality of Opportunity Must Start in the Womb. It was then rewritten to fit the video format. If you want to be part of this essay to video process, you can click on the link in the description and give your feedback before an essay gets turned into a video. Perhaps you'll make a difference in how I rewrite it.